but one that I think is going to be a very, very interesting in terms of what's coming uh, in technology. Last year, as you probably know, if you were here, uh, Sean presented um, the uh, Microsoft uh, presentation of Jerry Jones, uh, where Connect was going with social networking. And we think that what you're going to see next is as interesting and as provocative as uh, last year's presentation. Uh, Mike works with uh, Image Metrics. Uh, it's an interesting company that's about 10 years old, 11 years old, uh, based in Manchester, five PhDs all in one room. So little oxygen, lots of energy. The company is also based in Los Angeles because its client base is around uh, the movie industry. So the type of 3D facial animation it provides is used by filmmakers such as um, Benjamin Button uh, that you saw. But more interesting to us and, and today's discussion is the work that they've been doing with Rockstar, with EA, Disney, Activision, in games like Grand Theft Auto, Halo, uh, and, and uh, uh, Red Dead uh, uh, Redemption. And you'll see where this technology is going and how it's going to be much more applicable in the years to come. So, Mike, if I can have you come up. So, hi, everybody. I, uh, thanks for the introduction, Matt. I'm Mike uh, from Image Metrics. I run the research team there. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about player character creation, expression, and interaction. Uh, a little bit of a slightly, slight change in the title that was in the program, but you know, these things happen, don't they? Um, so first of all, let me kick off by playing a short video. I have a rendezvous with death at some disputed barricade. It may be he shall take my hand and lead me into his dark land and close my eyes and quench my breath. I have a rendezvous with death. And I, to my pledged word, am true. I shall not fail that rendezvous. In that, in that trailer, we saw some good examples of expressive and emotive characters, characters that the gamer can really get an emotional connection with. Um, we saw things like nuanced facial expressions. We saw natural motion, natural body motion, atmospheric graphics, good vocal performances. And as an industry, we've become increasingly good at producing that type of character. But if we think that's all there is to an expressive character, we're missing something. What we need to remember is that the character represents, represents the gamer in the game's world. Um, in order for the gamer to feel a true connection with the character, he has to be able to express himself, him or herself, through that character. And in order to express yourself truly, interaction with the character is crucial. So what I'm going to talk about today is about how we can work towards removing the limitations in character, player, interaction making it a more natural process and thereby increasing the relationship between the character and the player, uh, deepening their immersion in the game world, drawing their gaze into the game. In this way, the, the player will truly be able to represent and express themselves in the game world, interact with it, and interact with the other player characters in the game's world. So I'm going to talk about how we're working towards a more direct interaction between uh, character and the gamer, and the ways we've, the things we've already done to uh, produce this direct interaction, and what's coming in the future, in the near future, and how that's going to benefit, potentially benefit the industry. So, let me first talk about how we can potentially uh, improve this interaction between gamer and character. So, in today's production, um, professional game production environment, we've got access to a rich set of tools. Um, that allow us to create and interact uh, characters and, and create content. So one 
potential way of um, improving the consumer's experience is to migrate this technology into the consumer space, migrate it into their unconstrained environment, onto their standard pieces of kit. Now, this, this process has already started to happen, and we'll talk about that um, briefly later on. But if we're able to do this migration of technology, that will enable us to move from today's expressive user interface to a situation where we have full expressive interaction with a character where we can directly and fully interact with our character, with the other player characters, and with the game world in as natural a way as, and simple a way as possible. So, just to, to understand a little bit more about this, uh, what are the challenges that would face migrating this technology over? Well, on the professional production side, we've clearly got a lot of requirements. We, we've got a very high expertise level. The hardware we deal with is, is, is very specific, it's, it's, it's expensive. Uh, the quality that we're going for is, is exceptionally high. Uh, we're able to uh, cope with a certain amount of cost. We're able to tolerate a certain amount of cost. We're also able to tolerate a certain length of time turning around these characters. And we rely on, for our performance, professional actors, some, in some cases, fully trained professional actors. Um, we've got to migrate these requirements into the consumer space, sort of eliminating them and changing them. So the consumer can have no expertise of how the technology works. You can't have a complex calibration process, for example, in, in, in your um, motion capture. Um, the hardware has to be cheap, addressing the cost, and also familiar in some sense. So at least we have to allow the customer to become familiar with the hardware. Um, quality, well, maybe we can take a hit on quality a little bit. You know, uh, that can go down a bit. Turnaround, though, well, that has to go from days, weeks, to real time, pretty much, in order for this to be acceptable um, and usable as an interaction thing. And the performance is now not going to come from actors. It's going to come directly from your game player. So these are the challenges that we have to think about when we're talking about migrating technology. So we've already uh, had a long history of innovating hardware around this sort of area. So, you know, gloves, joysticks, uh, game-specific hardware, eye toys. They're all kind of aimed at um, producing a more natural uh, way for the gamer to interact with the character to enhance that relationship. And today's generation of uh, peripherals have really taken that um, a ver to a, ver a very... Uh, uh, far. So we've got the biggest potential for natural interaction than we've ever had. Um, these are fantastic devices, but they are somewhat tied to their specific uh, platforms. Um, so the question I, I ask is, is there, is there anything else out there that can provide this rich interaction potential, this rich information? And I would say that there is. I would say that there are cameras. Now, cameras provide... Uh, a massively rich stream of information, too rich in fact. I mean, in order to extract the information from the output of a camera that's useful for interaction, you need a hell of a lot of expertise. And this has been a pretty much a barrier in these being used in any sort of a way, in any meaningful way for, for character interaction, I would, I would say. But if we could use them, what's the potential? Well, it's pretty obvious. Connect sold over 10 million units, fantastic. Uh, but there are billions of cameras out there, and they're across all platforms. So this number pick from the web could be accurate. 4.6 billion cameras, phones sold. Uh, they're pretty much in everything that you buy, laptops, tablets, mobiles, webcams on, on PCs. If we could utilize cameras as a method of providing a direct interaction between gamer and character, then we could open up that interaction across multiple platforms, multiple application areas. So why am I standing here talking about characters, about interaction, and about cameras? Well, a little bit of background about Image Metrics, my company. So as Matt said, we've been around since 2000. We were formed by a bunch of PhDs. Um, after a couple of years, um, we moved into the performance-driven uh, facial animation market, so we're facial animation specialists. Um, over those nine years, we've accumulated a, a, a wide number of, of customers and, and a lot of experience in film, game, and uh, other areas, uh, even theater. Um, so our technologies, we've, we've pretty much applied our technologies to that professional production environment up till this point. 
and so we service we provide services and software for those professional game production environments. Uh, the product that we have that does that is called Faceware. But the key thing about us is that we use video as our input. So let me again just show, play you a short video. It's one thing to be a great warrior. It's another thing entirely to be able to do this um, kind of facial animation. OK, so if so I can pause that video. Um, so what we're seeing here is uh, an actor uh, shot with a video camera. And his performance mapped onto an animated computer character. Um, the, cr the crucial thing here is that this video is not reference footage. This is the input to the to the system that we take. So we don't we don't rely on like markers or makeup or anything like that. Our technology is fundamentally based on just analyzing what's going on on a video. So if I can move on. Um, so what, just a, a very, very brief overview of what we can do. So as I said, we take input from a video camera, and that can be like an iPhone camera or a professional quality uh, um, video camera. It doesn't really matter. Our, our environment in which we can capture is not fundamentally constrained in any way either. But what we're looking to achieve here is an analysis of what's going on in that video. So we're looking to extract information about the performance of the actor, the position of their facial features. The um, oh, that's fun. The uh, 3D head motion, the overall facial expression, things like that. And that's what our technology is tailored to. So we believe that because it's based on videos, it has great potential in migrating it into the consumer space. But we have, to, um, we have to address all of those challenges that we talked about. So before I go any further, I'm just going to show a, little, a few examples of, of our, our work in collaboration with many other studios, just to give you an idea of what we've achieved in the uh, professional uh, game creation space in the last few years. Zealot class. One got bias, the leader from the looks of him. Sacrifice your partner for the greater good. I will do as I said. Dudes, bro. Think about it, brother. While I was stuck cleaning the Argean stables, he chose you to destroy Ares. There are some things we need to discuss. And please, my son, stay out of trouble. Hmm? So remember, everybody, keep away from random grenades and stay safe the CC way. I say. I am Napoleon. I am Emperor. My name's John Marston. I'm looking for Fort Mercer. Fort Mercer? You did one of Williams and boys. Calm down. So, uh, oh, you thought we were done? We ain't done, baby! No way, no how! Ain't no stopping this train! Whoa! Okay, so that was just a little overview of some of the stuff we've done in the professional space over the last few years. So we've talked about um, the importance of interaction, and we've talked about cameras and, and my background. And so I'm just going to go through a few ex examples of where interaction might has proved to be important in the past, in the recent past, and, and where we might go with it. So I'm going to cover briefly um, something that's established, uh, the motion interaction that's been brought in over the last few years and become pretty established. And I'm going to talk about something that is going to allow us to deepen that relationship between player and character. It's been around for a little while, the idea that, you, that you're going to want to tailor your representation in-game, the idea of customizing your character, of creating avatars that reflect you in the way you want to be reflected. Um, something that's been around for a while, but I don't believe it's reached its full potential yet. And then we're going to talk about the most difficult challenge. Can we enable full character interaction? Can we allow the user to really, truly express themselves? Um, can we add the face? Can we add emotion to that? We've got some form of body. We've got customization. Can we complete the package? So first, let's just touch on uh, the, the uh, professional solutions to motion capture as a bit of background to technology transfer. So we've got like solutions like optical motion capture. They require a lot of expertise, a lot of setup, calibration steps. 
a lot of suits, markers, specialist hardware, big uh, stages, constrained environments. We've got other systems like inertial motion capture. And again, specialized hardware, um, specialized setup. Basically, the picture here is complex, expensive, and requires a lot of expertise. However, this tech has been transferred successfully into the consumer domain. We and Move, two examples of systems that contain both inertial and <coughs> marker-based components. Um, they've addressed all of these issues of expertise. They've presented the hardware in a form that's in some way familiar to the users, and it's given us a, a massive potential to improve that interaction between character and um, player. The Connect has taken this, some would say, one step further. We've got now a 3D active scanner, something that we don't even use perhaps for motion capture very much in the professional environment, uh, giving us a full depth image, a full depth image of the scene from, from which we can fit a skeleton. And this allows us to get more quality. So before with the Wii, you can only, can, you can only find out the motion in the areas of the controllers. Here, more points where we can guess what the motion is. Getting up there close to the pro stuff, not, the quality's not there, but we're getting a lot of data. This is the richest data that we've ever had. So they've addressed those challenges in this space in a number of different ways. But what benefits did we derive from that? Well, we all pretty much know what benefits they were. We opened up, and this new mode of interaction opened up much wider audience, different types of games, dri driving sales of platforms like the, the Wii and things like that. And again, as I think as was said this morning, that just looking at the current sellers, like the biggest seller now is uh, this Zumba Fitness, which... Uh, basically utilizes this interaction across all three of those different um, controllers. So clear benefits from enhancing interaction between gamer and character. And the major players are all interested in this and, and, and they're really buying into it with hardware solutions and, and technology solutions. So let's move on to something perhaps uh, slightly more interesting. Um, something that has been around character customization, trying to Allow, that, allow the user to really represent themselves in the way that they wish in-game. So we can think about this, again, as a, as a technology transfer. Um, so we might think of it as taking something like Maya modeling package or ZBrush or something, whatever you want, moving it into the consumer space, addressing all of these issues. Um, but the key thing here is that the character has to be compatible with the visual environment of the game. So when you're talking about very stylized environments, uh, relatively simple characters, you can get away with this. Um, it, wouldn't take the, uh, can, it wouldn't take the gamer very long to customize their character in the way they want to do that. Um, and that's probably a fantastic solution. It's been around for ages. But when you start moving into more, vi more detailed visual environments, that's when things get a little bit more challenging. The amount of effort it would take for one, you as developers, to create a platform in which um, users, uh, gamers can customize their characters is a lot of effort on your side. It's also a lot of effort for them to use it. You're starting to, you're starting to find that the expertise and the turnaround is becoming a barrier to them using this. Now, I'm going to be talking about faces here because this is my background. So let's take an extreme example, an example where the user wishes to put direct representation of themselves into the game. So how would we solve this in the professional market? Well, I'm going to hark back to a little project we did a couple of years ago called the Emily Project. It was done in association with USC, uh, the ICT lab there. Basically, we wanted to create a, a photo reel uh, animation of this actress, Emily. So we started by scanning her. And clearly, you're not going to be able to fit this hardware into a consumer's house. Um, it's a bit big. It's a light stage setup. It's, it's massive. It's very impressive. Um, and it produces results like this, incredibly detailed three-dimensional three information from which we can sculpt very accurate 3D models. Also gives you texture information. More than that, it gives you stuff that you can build renderers on. You put it all together, and what do you get? You get an incredibly high-fidelity avatar of the user. The key thing about this technology is what we've done is we've aided our process by taking information about the person and using it to create our models. And we, even, we do this in the professional space. Can we use this idea in the consumer space? Well, I think we can. And in fact, there are several systems around there that, that do this. We can't use a scanner. Well, 
we kind of could now because Kinect's out there. That's sort of in its infancy, but there's a lot of work around using Kinect. But let's take a sort of wider view. Can we use the cameras to do this? Well, as I said, there are a number of companies out there that, that actually offer solutions to do this with cameras. We have one as well. It's called Portable U. I'll just use it as an example of what's going on here. So what do we want to do? We, wanna, we want the user to supply a photograph of themselves. From that photograph, we want to extract some information. We want to build a 3D representation of the user and then extract the texture, paste it onto the mesh. Now, it just so happens that's exactly what our core technology does um, on the professional side. So we've been able to migrate this over to produce this avatar creation package called Portable U. So just a little bit of a um, spiel about how this is delivered. Uh, this is actually available as a, as a product right now. Um, it's a cross-platform, cross-application solution. Uh, basically puts the developers in control. It's not sold directly as a product to the consumers. You can use it as a service, put it in your game, use it to enable your users to put their likeness into your game. We, uh, it, the creation takes less than a minute. Avatars fully rigged, uh, you know, accessories, personalization, all of that. The key thing here is that you're putting the, the consumer in the place of the modeler and the rigger, and you're using data from this rich interaction and content creation device to do that. Once you've done it, what can you do? Well, we're pretty familiar with what you can do with avatars. Put them in content, put them in multiplayer games, in game engines, um, uh, accessorize them, open up um, virtual uh, uh, markets and and stuff like that. Um, so in, su in summary, in this section, we're saying so many players do like to see themselves in games, but only if it's easy and it matches the visual environment of the game. If we can achieve this, we're going to deepen that engagement between the player and the character, get a better immersion, uh, and then give, us a, give ourselves revenue. That, that relationship's deepened, so maybe they want to spend more money on customization, virtual goods, all that sort of stuff. But I don't think, think we've really seen the benefit of this, you know? Why do you go to all that trouble of putting your face in the game if all it does is fire off a couple of smileys that aren't very convincing and or some pre-cammed animation that somebody else has created? It just doesn't seem like um, you're gaining that much. What we need here is the final component. We need you to be able to truly represent yourself in the game. So we need full character in interaction. So what I'm going to talk about now is um, facial animation and emotion and expression interaction. So again, let's just revisit the professional space. Lots of ways of doing this. It's really difficult. We haven't quite got it yet, I don't think. Even like your L.A. Noir is probably as far as we've gone. There's certain things about that that makes, means it's not perhaps success. Uh, you can't perhaps do it everywhere on, in every particular environment. But we might try a few approaches. We might try some facial mocap, um, whether with markers or makeup or whatever you want to do. We might try image metrics, visio based technique. Whatever you do, it's, it's, it's a big challenge. But it's very important, because without this, your characters are just like stony-faced, emotionless. They don't convey the emotion that you want to get across. But is there anything in these te techniques that we, can, that we can transfer to the consumer domain? Well, I hope so. Otherwise, this is a bit pointless talk, isn't it, really? So. Um, OK, yes, so the first thing I'll draw your attention to is something that's come out like literally in uh, the last couple of weeks, I think. It's been trailed for a while, but I think it's out now. So Avatar Connect. So the guys, in, the guys at Microsoft have, um, have released uh, this uh, product that, that relies on the Connect. Um, it seems to, from their tech video, it seems to uh, basically fit a mesh to the depth information and the texture information that you get from the Connect and uses that to directly drive an avatar. Um, this has kind of mirrored the motion capture idea over to the consumer space, and they've solved, put a lot of effort, a lot of expense in solving these problems. Um, okay, it's tied to the Connect, maybe not such a big deal for some, some people, developers who want to utilize the Connect. Um, their avatars are somewhat stylized. I'm not sure what that says about how, how far they feel they can push the tech. I guess we'll find out in the forthcoming months. I haven't seen anything from this. But it, it's a real indication that the major guys are really interested in this and they really see that it's key to this relationship between actor and character. So can we do something similar or better even? 
using a device that goes across domains, across mobile and everything that we've talked about. Can we do it with the camera? Can we transfer our core tech over to a consumer solution, solving all those issues? Well, at CES, we demoed um, a prototype technology, CES, earlier this year. And I'm just again going to play you a little video that shows a little bit of what, what this technology, this interaction technology can do. I'm Nick Ramsey and I'm the VP of Product Management at ImageMetrics. And what you're seeing here is a technology called LiveDriver. It's tracking all the features and the motion of my face. And in real time, it's transferring that as animation to the character on the side. So I can move my mouth, my eyes, and browse. And as you can see, the character is mimicking every movement. We can also switch to non-human characters, so a panda. And we can switch to more realistic game characters, like this. We can also, in real time, do normal map and shadows. Okay, so that's Nick and his live driving um, character. I wonder if I can do it here. I don't know, I'll have a go. <laughs> okay, so. Right, so here I am. Uh, that's, that's it. I'm now live driving this guy. Um, so it's quite a natural way to in, interact with a character. Um, So um, you can see the, poten the, the potential for this technology. This isn't a product yet, but it's something that we uh, are very keen to make available to the industry at some point in the near future. I talked about avatars. Um, so this guy's kind of st stylized. Um, but what about there's an avatar of, of me? So you can apply this to pretty much any character that you care to do. Um, I'm not going to push it, so I'm going to stop now. But anybody who wants to have a play with this, um, can come and find me afterwards. And I've, I've got it running on this laptop, runs on standard hardware. Um, it's running at 36 frames a second on this. And that's uh, actually throttled by the camera capture. On this, on this laptop, runs at 50, if you're lucky. So again, it's prototype. Um, there's things we can do to improve this. But it's uh, a demonstration of what's going to come in the near future. And I'm just going to stop it and switch back to the presentation. So I'm glad that bit worked. <laughs> ah, I knew it was going to work. Um, OK, so well, that might have set you w wondering about what you could do with that anyway. But let's just uh, let's sort of illustrate that. What can you do with this? Well, beyond the applications, you can, what, it, what we're actually doing is enhancing that player character interaction. We're allowing them to really, really interact with the game world, really and truly interact with the other players in the game world, really draw them into the game world. The potential for um, multiplayer games, for chat, real-time content creation, um, social networking, well, I guess it's up to you guys to decide what it is. We'll provide you with the technology, if it's appropriate for your application, and then you guys can decide what the potential benefits of this are. It's not, it's not for me to do that. I just write the programs. Um, oops. Let me uh, just summarize now. Um, run a bit short, actually, so a bit, bit nervous. I went through it a bit quick. But, um, so what have we talked about? We've talked about how interaction is a crucial part of expressive characters. And it's crucial, you know, you want to really want to engage your user with the player, and you gain a lot of benefits from doing that, from immersing them in your game world. Um, the potential that we have to do that is migrating professional technology to the consumer domain, enabling these new interaction possibilities and drawing them into the game. And really, it's up to you guys to decide what we can do with this technology. So all that remains is for me to say. Thank you for your attention, and any questions? Okay. So I, I thought that was kind of exciting, just to give you a sense of uh, what's coming to the desktop. Uh, everyone, and I think in this room, in the next year, will have uh, you know cameras built in if they don't already into their devices. 
And uh, as Mike said, this is a tool that game developers can incorporate uh, quite easily uh, in the next year or so into, uh, into various products and titles. Uh, any questions that uh, you might have about, uh, about the, the trend, the process? Be happy to answer. Chris? Uh, you mentioned you want to bring this uh, to uh, the attention and uh, availability of the game creators. Um, aside from the obvious time and money aspect, uh, is this within, let's say, possible within the next 12 months? Uh, should people who are starting games in now or a year within the next year be uh, assuming that some version will be available for, as a as yeah. middleware? Well, I, I've been informed by our product manager that I need to be very cagey about that because we're a public company on, in, in the US. Yeah. But I, I can say that there are, there is, uh, there's a plan to make product announcements in the near future about this technology. So, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Is it worth game companies establishing contact? Oh, yes, very much so. Yeah, at this stage, we're, we're very, very interested. Very interested in hearing what people need for this to work in their, in their environment. You know, what the, te what the technical limitations are, the processing limitations, all the, all the sort of hardware stuff, but also what the user experience is that they're looking to enable. Um, it's reasonably robust right now, but it will become um, a real product in the very near future. Yeah. Right behind Chris. Uh, how, how many years do you think you're away from liberty? From Incorporating li the tongue as well, which is, I notice is absent and being yeah, able to actually okay. decipher what's going on. So, okay, we've got, t we, there's no teeth in that demo, but we've got the teeth in there. The tongue's very difficult. <laughs> I think you're better off trying to do phoneme detection and put the tongue in the right place based on that, to be honest. It seems in incredibly impossible to visually see where somebody's tongue is. There's also an aspect of uh, multi-language. I mean, we all, I guess, by and large in this room speak English, but there are other markets where uh, they can drop in or dub in you know, by looking at the mouth. Yeah, the, um, I mean, the potential there is um, if you can... Uh, you needn't even use like the mouth part. If you can integrate this with some audio technology that knows what the person's saying, um, you can get the expression from the rest of the face and from, from the facial animation, and you can drop in like audio-based phoneme shapes. So effectively, you just need to transfer that over the network, and somebody can be speaking to you in English on one end of the chat. The other end of the chat is coming out in Spanish with, with lip sync or something like that, you know? So it's, uh, there's, there's incredible potential to do this. I mean, we didn't even touch on like network bandwidth. Um, basically, sending this animation through the network is 40 numbers a frame or something like that instead of a video. Right. So, so it, it's incredibly efficient. Uh, yeah, as you get into two uh, iPads, etc., you've got two-way conversations going on. Yeah. You got. You can't get me talking about the, the actual tech though, because I'll just bore everybody about it. That actually that leads into my next question, which is yeah. outside the games industry, the conversation with Skype and people like that, because it's it's got to be great fun if I can. Well, yeah, I imagine. Talk to my children as a panda one day. <laughs> <laughs> How's that going to be bad? Yeah, no, it's a, it, it definitely is. You're right. Um, also, it seems to be phrased as a business to business proposition at the moment. What, why not do a direct to consumer? Well, we're we're kind of well. So our, our company background is in in services on on the um, commercial game production side. Uh, we have a development. We've just recently moved those services in more as a product, but that's the first time we've actually made a product, even for the for the games industry. The amount of effort it would take us to move this into a full consumer application might be. It doesn't seem like it's the most we're the most appropriate people to do that, but if we can make a, um, an SDK or an API available, and you know what the computational requirements of that are, then you can put it in anything that you want. Now I'm not the business guy about this. I'm the tech guy, so Matt's your man to talk to about um, the business side of things, and he'll pass you on to 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 the guys who want to talk about business models with you. <laughs> 